Hey everyone, this is Steli FD, and today I'm excited to introduce a special episode of the Inner Work podcast for you. The first interview we're ever publishing on the podcast, and it's with Kevin von Douglas Edu. Kevin is the husband of Sylvie von Douglas Edu, and Sylvie is one of the most prolific Muay Thai fighters in the world. She's a, an incredible human being that is on a mission to break records and break barriers. Her goal is to become the fighter with the most recorded fights in history of humanity. She already is the Western fighter with the most fights in Thailand, approaching 300 fights. And the two of them are an unusual team and couple in an unusual world. They're incredible storytellers, content creators, philosophers, you know. I am a huge fan of their content. I've consumed hundreds and hundreds of hours of their content. And at the end of this interview, I was inspired, I was in awe, I was in love, I was just all the way thrilled, and I know that you are going to feel the same way too. So without further ado, here's Kevin for you. Just maybe to give you a little bit of a context on how well I know you guys, like I, I think I've been consuming your content for at least four years, okay. and, and when I... When I get into, um, I have these, like I'm a passionate person when it comes to storytelling. I love fighting. I love fighting. I have a huge passion and interest in it. And I think when I first found Sylvie, it was on YouTube. And I think it was the little mini documentary about her, right? Uh, oh, so right. there's actually two, but I think the one you're talking about is so beautiful. What is it called again? It's under the, uh, is it under the rope? It's under the rope, I think. I yes. Think it's called under the rope. Yeah. And you know, what's funny, this is a very common pattern, I, I you know, in, in life. In, in, and so I think this is probably also very common for you guys. But the first time I, I watched something of Sylvie's, I saw that little documentary and it was kind of a cool thing I was watching while having breakfast. Like I was just looking for some Muay Thai content and it just popped up in a recommendation. And I remember watching it and going, that's kind of cool. That's a cool person. And I just went on with my life, right? I didn't pay too much attention. Right. And then it probably took half a year until I encountered Sylvia again on some YouTube uh, thing. And uh, the second time again, maybe with a little bit more interest, but still very casual, very like, oh, all yeah. right, whatever. I think right, it took yeah. it took a year before I finally really got deep into the rabbit hole and was... Mm where my interest had now been like penetrated enough that it kind of broke open. I was like, all right, I, now I'm interested. I want to know who is this person? What is, I want to watch fights. I want to learn more. Then I discovered you. I'm like, this is very interesting. This is a very unique couple. <laughs> it was a very unique team in fighting. Yeah. Well, we can't, we kept me out of the narrative for a very long time, but it got to a point where we were like, let's include this other voice because it's an important part of what's going on. And also uh, I could be more supportive in content. So probably when you jumped in was kind of when I jumped in. When you jumped in, probably. And, and then I got really deep. Like I, you know, there were a couple of weeks where I consumed hours of content. Like I try to catch up with things Very like cool and really like really get on, on top of things. You guys have an amazing podcast. Um, the Muay Thai Bones podcast. Yeah. Uh, and I love so, it. So I've listened to every single episode. Oh. It's, <laughs> and it's the kind of content, uh, Kevin, that is <laughs> such a unique niche of what I love. You know, it's. Oh, that's good. So, so the two of you talk Muay Thai, which I love. You talk fighting more broadly, which I love. But then much more so, you guys talk about philosophy, psychology, mentality, culture. You yeah. talk about, you know, That's all so kinds good. of things. In the middle, there's always a little bit of like, there's a beautiful dynamic between the two of you of like sometimes bickering. One can give the other what they want. And you get into like these little, you know, these little like, oh, took a left turn, but the other person took a right turn. And then you have to find, <laughs> find back together. Totally. Um, but these are, you know, very kind of in-depth, very philosophical um, 
in very deep conversations. And I, you know, this is like, this is a unique order. You know, if I could have create, if I could have ordered somebody to do this podcast, I would have just for my personal pleasure. So I absolutely love uh, the content you guys create, the storytelling, everything. Um, and that's so good because it comes out of who we are. So you and I and Sylvie must be good friends yes. without having spent time <laughs> because when you're just driving in a car for three hours, just what you are comes out. So it's very, it sounds great to have you connect with so many pieces of that. Yes. For me. Um, yes. And they, you know, I'm, so I'm a huge fan. Um, we've become more friendly. I mean, emotionally, I feel very connected to the, the two of you and I feel very invested in your journey. Um, we've had not had, uh, you know, time together, but I see that in our future, there's projects that we've been talking about of tackling together. I've been a, a small a sponsor of uh, Sylvie's for the last one and a half, two years or so. Um, and so there's a million questions I have for you. And there's a bunch of stuff I'd love to like tackle, but that I'm curious about. And so I'll, I'll take this opportunity as a personal, like me intruding the Muay Thai Bones podcast, a special episode of it, where I can just ask my questions, my curiosities. Fantastic. So um, he, here, you know, th there's especially things that I care about are going to be less about, you know, the, this fight or that fight or this performance or that performance or a technique Good. or her skill set but more, I'm much more curious about the behind the scenes of the journey. And especially yeah. when I look at all the conversations the two of you have and all the things, the training sessions that I see and the kind of uh, afterwards, the, the, the post-training breakdowns you do and the, the conversations, how you frame the phases that Sylvie's in in her development and her mm -hmm. training and her career. Mm -hmm. um, to me, what's striking is that a lot of it is about what I would call kind of the, the inner game of fighting, right? It's, it is a, a lot about the, the mental side, the emotional side, sometimes the spiritual side, the philosophical side. There's also physical parts, but I find almost that the two of you, at least when you have conversations, at least on the podcast and other formats, those are the parts that you're least interested in. Yes. And even when I see like, you know, you guys are on Patreon, um, there's a massive library there of Sylvie training with legends of Muay Thai of the sport. You've created this incredible library preserving the legacy of these um, incredible fighters that were not active in Muay Thai anymore and where they were fading out of the public eye and all their technique and their knowledge and their stories and all that would have been just gone for the world. Oh, right. that's so yes. And so and so you you travel through Thailand. There's thousands of these videos from these incredible people. Even when I see um, Sylvie in a training session, right, with yeah. a legend and or a crew, and you just see her throw punches and kicks, and her technique is being corrected or critiqued, or there's technique being added. Almost always, when I watch these sessions. I can tell both you, you're, you're videographing most of it, you're, you're capturing it on video and taking beautiful pictures of, of Sylvie's journey, but almost always there's also a big mental component. There's like when something isn't clicking, there's a Sylvie might, you know, laugh and look at you and go, you know, I'm too tense or I can't relax into this. Or <laughs> there's always like a, a mental thing in fights when you're at the corner and you record in live stream, the fights that Sylvie yeah. has, when you shout instructions sometimes it's very like just more teeps more teeps or whatever it is combos whatever the the theme of the, yeah. the the days but there's also i can tell there's so much mental uh analysis going on you guys are very cognitive very thoughtful people right you're people yeah. that are very deep in thought and take what you do very very seriously so yeah. i want to talk about that side i want to like okay focus on that side a little bit. Here's where I want to start. This is maybe okay. a weird question. I don't know if you've talked about this a lot, but I want to talk about Sylvie's first fight. Yes. And I, I know that the, the, the backstory, as far as I know it is, you know, Sylvie watched on back or you guys watched a movie together. Sylvie's yeah. interest in Muay Thai was peaked. There's Master K, I think, right? Like yeah. <laughs> the 80s <Yeah>. movie, <laughs> 80s movie yeah. sensei. <laughs> yeah, totally. It was like a karate kid. Kind of. <laughs> yes. 
old Mr. Miyagi type Mr. <laughs> situation. <laughs> old guy in his garage that you know happens oh, to be boy. awesome with Thai trainer that takes her under his wing. She trains for a while. She wants like th this dream pops up of like maybe we could go to Thailand for a while and have a real fight there, right? Yeah. And then you guys save up money. Up until that, you're both teachers. What, what were you doing? Help me again. What was your background? Uh, Sylvie was a, a bartender. Mm. We met in college. I went back to college late, later in life. And she came out of uh, co college and became a bartender around that time. And I was, um, a, I can't remember the exact timetable, but I think I was a social media consultant mm. uh, right around that time. And actually... That played into us putting everything on YouTube and everything because I was new to, uh, to social media consulting back then. And so I just experimented all my ideas on what she was doing and it kind of caught the first part of the social media wave. Uh, she's, I think, the most documented fighter in the history of the world in any sport. Um, and part of that just was because of what I was doing at the time. But um, yeah. So what did you want to add? Uh, uh, so, why so, are you drawn to the first fight? Because I'm drawn to the feelings before the first fight. I'll tell you why. Mm. This is a personal, a personal history. My, I have two older brothers. And both of them uh, were boxers. Funny enough, maybe because they were into it, I never went into martial arts or boxing or anything young in life. I'm really regretting this. I got into fighting you know, in my mid-30s, right? Super late. But I remember um, one of my brothers had trained for a year or two, and then he had signed up to have a real to have a fight. Mm. And I was 13 at the time, right? I didn't know much about boxing. And I remember, I mean, the amount of anxiety I had uh, every single day, the fears, the, I, would, I remember wow. playing it bad at night and trying to figure out what can I do to stop wow. this from happening, right? To oh, you didn't want him to fight at all. No, no. <laughs> I was like, how can I, to me, emotionally, you know, I could not differentiate between like how safe or, or difficult is it? This is an exciting endeavor. This no, to me- Something bad was gonna happen. <laughs> there is a fight This seems threatening. How do I make sure this doesn't happen? And maybe also my brothers were bouncers in clubs, Oh, and when I, was, well. when I was like 12, there were a couple of times, like they were, especially one, the one that had the fight, he, he would take me with him to clubs when I was really young. And there were one or two times where he got into very dangerous altercation with big groups of people and where I had real fear for, all right, you know, my, my brother might get like stabbed right now. There's people with knives and- Yeah, more, much more dangerous than a boxing <laughs> match, actually. But, but maybe that like imprinted on me. So I was so afraid be. of that. It was so afraid of that boxing fight. And then I remember he was training really hard. And funny enough, you know, in hindsight, he, you know, later he told me he hated you know, the, the preparation for the fight so much that, uh, and he peaked too early, he pushed himself too early, and then he was like Aww. exhausted towards the end. And his opponent pulled out five days before the fight. Oh, wow. And they couldn't find a replacement. And my brother was basically like, all right, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to revisit this next year. I'm not doing a fight, you know, in the next couple of right. months. He never fought, right? That was it. Uh, <laughs> was just oh, that, was it. Okay. <laughs> that was it. That was it. But I, the amount of relief I had, I was so grateful for the guy pulling out, you know, and there was uh, a, a very stressful, like, I don't know what it was like a two month period where it was just stressed out of my mind for my brother. Wow. And then later, I remember talking to a friend once I got into boxing and Muay Thai and fighting. And I was like, mm. now I think back and I'm like, why I didn't have the fight? It would have been so amazing. Now I would have been excited for him. And the right. difference perspective makes, right? When you, when you train or when you study and when you get knowledgeable about the sport, you see the art, you see the skill. Yeah. You can also assess, yes, it can be dangerous, but you can you have a better sense for it, right? It's not life yeah. or death. So yeah. when you and I, when we watch fighting, we see beauty, we see art, yeah. we see human potential manifested, yeah. we see people yeah. engaging in something that's so difficult to do, yes. it's incredibly difficult. So we have admiration. We see the technical aspect, right? The skill. Yeah. But when my mom, you know, sees fighting no. or most of the people I know, my friends, all they see is brutality, right? Violence. Yes. yes. And so I'm curious about that first fight. Both from Sylvie's perspective, was she just excited? How, how were her nerves? 
that were there fierce, but also from your perspective, you're a husband, your boyfriend at the time, I don't know. Like how, were you guys never affected by any kind of fear? Were you just adventure and yay? Or never. did you have any kind of, never? That's never. It was, it is weird that you ask this. It, it actually, our first fight was in the United States. Sylvia had been training with Master K, it was like a 72, three year old Thai man who was old fashioned and traditional. So she never was in a class of Muay Thai. She just trained with him individually. So he never sparred with her and he never clinched with her. So she had all this kind of pad work and like knowledge, but she had no sparring knowledge. And we finally like went to New York City and had her spar like twice before this fight, which was down in West Virginia in an amateur uh, tournament, the WKAs. But honest to God, thinking back to that, driving down, and I was just thinking about it today because Michael Jackson died on our way down. It was very memorable. Mm -hmm. And it was like, um, it is, my memory of it is exactly like all our fights. Like nothing has changed at all. The feeling is, is like, um, she's underprepared on, on one level because she's trying to reach for a certain excellence, mm -hmm. even in her first fight, even in her last fight, which was her 267th fight more than any Westerner ever in Thailand, like by a, a multiple multitude, she still is reaching and has the same emotional motivations that she had in their very first fight, that in that fight, she is going to be reaching for something in her soul, in her heart that she's trained for. And there is, there is this weird thing that I just have a faith in her. She's a very stubborn, tough person. And so if her skills can't protect her, if something happens, she has a reserve that is very deep in her that will preserve her. And uh, it's exactly what I felt in that first fight. And I feel it every single fight. It is unreal that nothing has changed after all these years and all these fights. And she's taken a lot of physical uh, pain and damage. She has had over 200 stitches to her face, which is incredible. Uh, broken bones multiple times, like, but it's a belief I have in her resilience as a person that the things that can wound her are not physical. They do not feel physical. So I don't have that fear of, of, of her being damaged in a weird way. It's more of like, I hope she performs to her expectation close enough that she doesn't come out of the ring emotionally wounded or psychologically weighed down. And I think most of our struggles is more, you say mental, it's very much in the mental world of dealing with expectations and desires and then performance. Like the beautiful thing about fighting is you're put, you're an artist put in, in a situation that not only is the canvas you're painting on is fear, your own fear, yeah. all of the like things that a human animal gets triggered, that's your canvas. And then you have a will who is trying to embarrass you or shame you opposite you. And that's your art. Like what artist does that? It's so incredible. And so that's really every single fight. That's the battle right there, even to this day. It's and I, it's, it's very cool that you asked that question about the first fight because it's no different. That's crazy. See, this point points me to, I didn't think that I would get to this question this quickly, but it, <laughs> the way the way you shine for Sylvie, the way you feel oh. and think about, like it, I just can't but address that, you know, and like talk a little it bit is. about that. Listen, you guys are unusual people in an unusual world, right? Like you are yeah. standing out. You, you know, you have a very interesting relationship from the outside, you know, watching you guys because Sylvie is the fighter. He's the center yeah. of attention when it comes to at least the journey of your life for the past couple of years of like her journey to greatness, to Everything. try to accomplish something that has yeah. never been accomplished before, be the fighter with the most recorded fights in history, right? Yeah. Female or male. That's such yeah. a big mountain to climb that you both are like on this journey together. 
yeah. you as our husband are not her trainer. You're not her coach. No. You're not her manager, no. which would be all the available typical options you know, totally. for, for the husband that is involved totally. in his wife's fighting career, right? That, those are, that's pretty much it. Either these things or you're not involved at all other than coming to fights and being like, yeah, babe, go. But oh, you, boy. you know... I, I have a theory, but I'd love to hear your way of explaining it. What would you, how would you, how do you describe your role in, in, uh, in all of this? That is very interesting. That is very interesting. <sighs> Late, lately, something we've talked about, and an, just a, a very broad analogy is, I imagine the road and she runs it. And, but what I use to imagine the road is I'm really good at understanding landscapes, whether they're for her or what is possible. I think mm -hmm. a lot about what is possible and I get intuitions about what is possible. So very much what I um, do is I kind of set the compass heading taking as much as I can intuitively on what Sylvie wants. Like mm. it's kind of interpreting her desires into actionables. And then she just is an unbelievable driving force. And we're always um, recalibrating about what's possible or what you want or whatnot and always temperature shake taking. But what it's led to, this weird combination between those, is that Sylvia has just gone off the charts of what was possible for a female fighter or almost any fighter. Um, and honestly, at this point, I feel like this all has been prelude. But I feel like I'm not answering your question almost because it's too vast. But so maybe <laughs> if you like, if you uh, uh, refine it or cut an angle on it uh no, I would you know you know I, understand no i think that that's that's actually great because to to some degree here's how i see it to some degree the way that it presents itself to me is that you know you guys are an amazing team to a large degree because you're she's very set in a role like she is the the fighter She's the person to try to, the record breaker, the person that's trying to accomplish a certain yeah. very specific, very numeric, like a very like sp specific goal and target. Yeah. You are not fitting into a role, yeah. right? In my mind, you know, when, what I see is in terms of the things you do, just, you know, you take pictures of her. You, so you document the journey, you take pictures, you video her fight, you video her training sessions, you help document and archive her history and her journey. Yeah. You help manage, um, you know, the storytelling aspect, the blog on YouTube, like the, the kind of projects you guys do together. Then you're somebody that constantly thinks about her and constantly yeah. thinks about her fighting and constantly, you know, yeah. analyzes about what has just happened and thinks about what could happen next and what could what would be possible next. So you're almost a personal philosopher and fighting therapist, you know, and and brainstorm well, buddy. You know, <laughs> well, what's weird is that she also is an incredibly reflective, mm -hmm. intellectual mm -hmm. person. She has great depth, and when she does a vlog or something and puts it up, I go watch it because mm -hmm. I want to learn something. Like she's thinking and seeing things that I can't see. I, I guess when you're talking to me, I, I guess an important part, part to point put out there is that she is to me heroic. Mm. I see her heroicism more than she does. She is a grinder and very, very stubborn. She has her dreams, but she's an incredibly harsh person to herself. Her critical voice is absolutely intense. So I kind of, what I do is I see her in this shining way. This her, I see her heroic possibilities. She's kind of a pessimist and I'm the balancing optimist. And so I'm constantly trying to, every time she's like, we're locked in a room, I can't get out. And I'm like, 
we can put a window here, we can put a door here. And so a lot of what I do is carpentry, is just create avenues for which her to get out of her own pessimism. And so she, we kind of are balanced. Her pessimism also is a conservativeness that also balances my optimism. Mm. So we kind of complement each other. It couldn't just be like crazy optimism to make this happen. Right. She would have to be quite stubborn and mm, closely compressed. And so that, a lot of what I do is that. And then another thing that I do that's, that we don't really talk about, but sometimes it's counter to Sylvie. Even if they're good people, they just have investments in life and the world and in Muay Thai that really are not about her benefit or maybe many other people's benefits. And so a lot of what I do is I have a very good uh, spidey sense about, no, let's not move in that direction, which is very difficult for a female fighter because female fighting is has far fewer opportunities, especially, uh, and then in Thailand, you have a kind of like male, uh, a gendered coded sense to opportunities. And so female fighters very often get aligned with forces that really eliminate, eliminate their opportunities without them even realizing. They're just aligning themselves at people with people who will help them in the short term. And so a lot of what I do is steering clear of big potholes. And then I just let Sylvie run in a, give her like a big field of green and run. And it works pretty good. I mean, it's yeah. still very stressful. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll say this, you guys are probably the, the most beautiful love story in fighting that, that, <laughs> that I've ever seen. And, and not in a, and the funny thing is not in a romantic kissy kissy yeah, yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. but in a, the amount of love and passion and dedication yeah. and belief you have for her is definitely the wind to the big and beautiful sailing sails that she has as her potential. Like, and he so pushes like, you, you guys. You don't even know. The <laughs> world does not even know yeah. what she has inside of her heart. She is a yeah. volcano of possibility. <laughs> and she is just, even after 267 fights, she's just now peeling off the top layers that have a freedom of expression that is just, I, I am usually not wrong. I have very good intuitions. What's coming is if we can hold everything together and keep the opportunities right, is gonna be really unreal, like unreal. I'm I great. honestly think she's gonna be the best female fighter who, who ever lived in any sport if she has the opportunity for the next uh, maybe eight to 10 years of fighting. I'm very I don't know, I just it. feel, I can yeah, see it, I can yeah, feel it. Yeah. It's a spiritual thing. It's not about skill, talent. Hmm. It's just, uh, just this incredible powerhouse within her. And then all those, as you mentioned, the knowledge that she has of having trained with legends of the sport, just literally a hundred of them. Like no fighter ever has had that input from history. Hmm. Mm. I just uh, it's very exciting stuff so I you get me if you get me on the Sylvie train I'm like <laughs> wow I am so excited by it it is unreal that's amazing okay unreal. so you you touched on uh, on something I wanted to explore which is Sylvie's internal harshness right mm. and and this is something where I relate to very deeply with Sylvie. Oh, <laughs> you know? I'm sorry to hear that because that is a heavy <laughs> burden. That is a heavy burden. You know, it is a incredible gift and a, and a, and a big burden, right? It is, I find yeah, it's that- true. It's true, it's I true. find that um, a lot of the things that I've been able to accomplish in life and the reason why I'm able to be very valuable to a lot of people Mm. is because I've pushed myself so relentlessly my entire life forward. Yeah. And with that comes a, a strength and an ability to carry responsibility or to burden things that helps the world and helps lots of people. Yeah. But for your inner happiness, it is not necessarily no. like, no. The, you know, the greatest path. It doesn't lead to any no. kind of inner peace or happiness. It's very, very, very hard, it's, which is part of my respect for her too. And my respect mm -hmm. for you, if you mm -hmm. carry that 
harshness of criticism towards yourself, it is, um, it is unending, relentless. And this is part of why one thing that I do is you're, you talk about how in fighting, you don't really focus too much on the physical thing, like keep the hand up or mm. do this thing. Because for a critical person like her and possibly you, if you concretize something too much, it is going to lock up. Mm -hmm. It is, it is counterproductive. And Sylvia learned this herself. She's spoken of it in fights. If she goes into a fight and she's like, just do these three things, throw a jab, move. I don't know what the third one would be. She would do none of them. <laughs> and the more she tried to fix some concrete thing, the more she would lock up. And it took her over a hundred fights to realize you cannot do that. Mm. And so what I have generally done and is long wave, long wave uh, achievement. And that's why we're like a hundred fights, 200 fights, screw trying to win some belt somewhere that doesn't really matter to anybody. Let, let's tr try to do these very long wave runs to keep us out of these things that lock up when you get really critical of yourself. And we have a phrase that we use like water over the stone. Mm. It's just like, don't worry about how you performed. It's water over the stone, water over the stone. So that's why I'm like, 267 fights, it's just the beginning because mm. we are thinking in very long waves mm. because, but for that reason, because of the harshness of self-critique is just crushing. I've, I've watched Sylvie's kind of earlier footage when she was training or fighting and more recently. And in that kind of harsh uh, back and forth context, you can sense a difference. She is a lot more, she seems a lot more relaxed. She still seems very self-critical, but less so. Yeah, like there's a bit of a, a, a more relaxed uh, energy to it. And in, in fighting, and I learned this myself, and like I know nothing about fighting. I've been training for a couple of years, but I've never fought really. But yes. I've observed this yet. I've observed <laughs> this myself where one of my biggest one of the biggest things slowing down my development was the way how much I was in my head and how much criticism was going on during training, yeah. right? And also from day one, I can't help it. I would compare my performance on day one with pro fighters that are like legends. And then I'd yeah. be like, well, I am just the worst person to ever do this. And yeah. here's the 300 things I can point out that I did wrong. Yes. And all that, all that that does is it tenses you up, it overwhelms yeah. you, and it yeah. slows you down, right? 100%. And it took me many, many years, many years. It actually also took me an LSD experience, to, to be uh, honest. Uh, yeah. I had to be on acid once while watching fights and then get, get into oh. like a flow of shadow boxing yes. where I saw my body move freely you know, without any self-criticism, with any slowdown. And I was like, wow, I didn't know that I can do, I can already do much more than I thought exactly. I can when I'm not tensing up yeah. so much, when I'm not holding back so much. And that really changed. There was a before and after when you saw me inspiring before, I was very tense mm. and very self in my mm. head. And afterwards, I was, I moved much more freely, loosely. You would have the impression that I was comfortable and having fun versus before you'd yes. had the impression that I'm really stressed out about the situation. Yes. And when I, when I, um, what I'm curious about is that journey. I mean, you've been kind of an influ influence of taking away some of the dark clouds, you know, pointing in yeah. a very long-term direction, but were there maybe inflection points, moments that clicked for Sylvia that you observed where you saw it before and after and said, oh, this fight or this conversation or this yes. moment made her relax a little bit more? What were the Well, were the the, the, she talks about the biggest stone that just flipped things around where, and if you follow our content, you probably heard her talk about it, but we had just moved to Pattaya after two years in Chiang Mai. Sylvia had already had like 75 or 80 fights, which already was just like a, an unheard of number. So when you fight so much, you should, you're supposed to be really good, like all the self-criticism, blah, 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 blah. And she had just moved to Pattaya with the new gym here and she fought a local star 
uh, Cherry Seogong, and she got destroyed. And it was um, embarrassing. Like Sylvie has great pride, actually, which is actually part of some of her most difficult qualities is that pride can hold her um, very harshly towards herself. So she actually, at that point, had, I think it was three days later, which is very rare, another fight scheduled against a Japanese world champion, Sai Ito, in Bangkok on the biggest show of the year. And she had never been on such a show. And she was basically, there is nothing I can do physically to change myself mm -hmm. from that horrible, embarrassing fight with my new gym in my corner to fighting a world champion who everybody called the phenom on television. And she finally embraced mental training. And for the longest time, she knew mental training was what you needed to do, visualization and everything. And she just said, fuck it, I'm going to dive in. And for three days, I don't think it was actually the mental training so much, but she let go. Mm. She was just like, I cannot control my performance. And she got a couple of really good tips, uh, breathing exercises, simple visualizations. And she won that next fight. And it was a huge victory. And um, that was a, a turning point, was the first time that she felt, I think, she would speak for herself, but I think she felt, wow, maybe I am among one of the better fighters at my weight in mm -hmm. the world. Because she didn't believe that at all at that point. And uh, that was a huge point. And... Other inflection points, uh, that was some years ago. That was many, many years ago, yeah. like maybe six years ago. And I'm trying to think of another inflection point, like, I don't know, I, my mind is blanking on it because <laughs> no there's worries. so many, many. fights, mm. many. Uh, uh, another, this is a separate one, but and would you follow us so you would know this, but when COVID hit, we were like, well, the, Sylvie's famous for fighting more than anybody. She would fight more than 30 times a year and there weren't gonna be fights. And that's when we made a decision that we're gonna just go to what we call Sylvie 3.0, which is a completely different fighter and take the next year and maybe she won't fight at all. It's not even been a year since that happened. And we made a, a firm uh, commitment to sparring a ton. Like Sylvie always, didn't like sparring. It made her feel bad. It built a lot of negative thoughts about herself, like you said, a mm -hmm. lot of self-criticism. But my theory was, and still is, that the reason why she's so tense in fighting, beside the fact she's much smaller than almost all of her opponents, is she does not have the eyes to see what's coming. Mm -hmm. And it's like if you're walking in a room that's dark and there's furniture, you're gonna be tense. Mm -hmm. You're gonna bang your shin. Things are gonna come where you don't expect them. So we devoted this entire year to growing eyes, being able to see in the dark under the theory that when you can see, the organism is gonna relax. And mm -hmm. that's what you're seeing when you say that there's a difference. And mm -hmm. it's still, we're just in the beginning stages of that, but it's made a huge difference because things slow down. The organism can perceive things moving through space. You're not being shocked and stunned by what just hit you. And it's a very, a very big part of, that was a big turning point that Sylvie just finally was like, I'll give into this. And so she's been sparring like an unbelievable amount. It's such a beautiful thing. I think, you know, and, and this is probably a metaphor for many areas in life, right? The eyes. Yeah. I can, so let's say I learn Muay Thai, right? I'll learn to punch, I'll learn to kick right? Yes. Then I learn to block, right? So I can like defend myself. And then maybe I learn to move, like what's the right way to move. I got these three things, sort of I know how to fight now, right? I know how to throw kicks and punches and move and block something. The big component that's missing though, is kind of also a component where I can't just do a pat session and now you have great eyes. Like now you, you have a set, no. like it doesn't work that way. Is that no. if I, while you stand in front of me, 
cannot tell what you're going to do, what kind of kick or punch you're going to throw, knowing how to block something isn't helping because it, it makes it worse. It makes it worse because <laughs> I'm, you can't I, stop. I, like, you can't stop I can't, it. Yeah. And, and also even knowing what to throw is not helping yeah. when I don't see the openings or don't know how yeah. to create them. Yeah. And so this is something I love. Uh, uh, Israel Adesanya says this MMA fighter who always says, mm. I don't uh, hope and throw, I aim and fire, right? Mm. And you see this even with professional fighters. Sometimes you can see they tense up and they throw a combo. Yeah. They're just like, they already knew what they're going to do yeah. independently yeah. of what the opponent does. They're just going to exactly. throw the combo and hope one of the four punches hits, right? Yes. And, and then there's fighters where you can see they never do that. They always yeah. see the opening or create it. And then when they throw, they have a much higher percentage of hitting or hurting, right? Or their, their punches lead to a, a path that they're building up to yes. that then ends the fight or wins them the fight versus... I just throw every combo as its own unit. And I hope by the end, <laughs> this sort of worked out into a victory, yes. but it doesn't build on top of each other. It doesn't, uh, 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 there's no real path that I'm building that I'm working towards. Well, well this is the huge difference between Western, with, to be very broad, Western concepts of fighting and Thai concepts of fighting. Like, uh, as you mentioned, you mentioned strike, block, da, 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 and then you learn how to move. In Thailand, you learn how to move first. There's so little correction in Thailand. The reason is, I believe, is that when you correct somebody, you tense them. Mm. So the number one thing, and they learn to fight very early in life, with six, eight, 10, 12 years old, is movement and relaxation. Mm. The exact mechanical proper Action is not important because you want to build from a from a bedrock of relaxation and movement, which event which actually leads to eyes. So you get your mm. eyes and your balance and your footwork relaxed, natural first. Then you start building strikes and defenses on top. In the West, we think very very differently. A lot of it is because martial arts we extract from other cultures. Mm. like karate, taekwondo, Muay Thai now, bo not boxing. Boxing actually understands eyes quite, quite well. Mm -hmm. But we basically create mechanical things that we correct and correct and correct, end up producing lots of memorized patterns, and we don't end up building eyes. And the one thing that Thais have over any fighters that they face almost always is their eyes. They're fighting. You can see this when, with San Chai fighting not bad fighters on Thai fight, he, the lights are on for him and the lights are off for the other fighter. And the other fighter could be a decent fighter. Yeah, I was just about to mention this. I loved the recent breakdown you guys had on the Muay Thai Bones podcast oh. about Senchai. You said the thing, I've been thinking this for years, like I've been watching him and thinking, this is so cute. He starts off and then if the opponent is sort of friendly, he gives him yes. kisses and he's just like, yeah. he's just playing. And if the opponent pisses him off, he goes and yeah. destroys these people. Yes. And yes. The, the main difference, this is a beautiful example for like eyes, um, is I can see what you're about to do. I can see your tendencies. Yeah. And so I'm relaxed because I'm fighting and you are in slow motion. Think about this. If yeah. you are in half the speed than a normal human, how relaxed yeah. would fighting be, right? I could see everything Very. coming a mile away, could 100%. get out of the way and... And now think for most people who don't have eyes, everything is three times the speed, right? Exactly. It's not even normal exactly. speed. You're in the ring and the adrenaline and everything makes everything so overwhelming. So now you're fighting like a Flash Gordon or something. So somebody that moves at superhuman speed and all you can do is be a tense ball and hope this yes. is going to end okay for you, right? Exactly. And, Very much so. And with Senchai, who's like a legend in Muay Thai and a very funny and interesting guy, but like uh, somebody that now fights, is an older fighter, but now fights kind of younger Western fighters that are not on yeah. his level. And is yeah. more like, sh I don't know, show fights, shorter round, mid three round fights or something like yeah. a shorter, shorter thing. You can see this nowhere better than that because you see people that are younger, stronger, more muscular and bigger than him. 
Yeah. And what you see is uh, you see him so relaxed and them so tense because he can see them move in slow motion. So there's no reason exactly. their muscles and their strength is irrelevant because they'll never hit him you know, with anything. Yeah. That's very and, true. Yeah. And you, and you see that they're uh, uh, better than anywhere else. Like what big of a difference it makes to be able and I, what are eyes to a big degree is being relaxed enough to be able to focus on perceiving the other person and not being mm. so much in your internal fear adrenaline mm. uh, that you're in your own mind and so you can perceive less right of what's really going on it's not only that it's the exposure to patterns that mm -hmm. allows you to recognize how that pattern is going to unfold before it even unfolds uh, sylvie trains uh, with karahat who kind of was sanchai before sanchai to me the most artful fighter ever in thailand and he started talking to her about like as soon as you see the weight shift onto the front foot you already know half the body is no longer going to act this is not a calculus this is just a feeling you're like i'm safe on this side as soon as there's a shift of weight that comes from just seeing it's like when you know a language and someone starts talking in a certain way you already kind of know what they're going to say mm -hmm. you can almost finish their sentences so it it's a familiarity with the body fighting in space also that um isn't it is there is nothing more important than that actually but it's hard to grow it is especially it is. when you start later yeah i think you don't like as children obviously we learn much faster much more intuitively uh also much more relaxed right children are much less inhibited by ego by having an identity by worrying about the future or about the past they're much more present in yeah. their the, the way they experience life so they're great learning machines right um and then later in life i think there's not a there's also not a clear path on how to learn this there's not a one two three step you know there's things yeah. you can do but um but you don't know how long it's going to take for you to start getting there or to grow that that part of it i want to touch on one more thing that I've been curious about as I've been okay. listening and, and, and studying with you guys and watching your journey, which is the thing I love about you guys the, the most, or one of the things that I really love about you is be, that you're so self-reflecting and that you're so philosophical and that you're analyzing things. You're also always experimenting. There's always something, a new diet, yeah. a new regimen, uh, yeah. a, a change of camps, a change of routines, uh, you know, a new theme, like you guys are constantly like this, is, this yeah. constantly chipping away at this piece of art of Sylvie's career and Sylvie as a fighter that you're like, that you're trying to get yeah. to. Sometimes, though, I wonder, like there, there have been moments, honestly, when I've listened to the Muay Thai bon, uh, Bones podcast and you've been analyzing a training session or a fight or something. And I've been thinking, wow, I feel overwhelmed at this point in a yeah. sense of, is it ever too much? Yeah. Do you guys ever feel like you've now like thought your way to too many things? And like, is there any, do you guys have any routine to have periods of time where there's no talk about it or there's no analysis or there's no philosophizing? It's just like, we're going to do a bunch of fights, but for a little while, we're just going to chill and talk about movies or something else. Mm. And we're not going to we're not going to keep looking at the problem because sometimes this looking away from the problem and taking a mm. break then gives you the fresh eyes at looking at it yeah. again and seeing it differently. How do you, is that just an external perception? Sometimes I, wor well, I worry or wonder I mean, if. I mean, the podcast is about fighting. So it, yeah, yeah, of it course. is like a hundred percent fight yeah, oriented. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, for me, I can talk about it from my end. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about fighting uh, or Sylvie's fighting. I am finding uh, flows to her freedom as a person. If, mm. if she didn't value fighting or wanting to be excellent in fighting, then her freedom would flow in a different direction. So I'm actually thinking about this stuff all the time as a function of my love for her. I keep seeing her getting caught and trapped by either opportunities in the world or her own little trap she sends for herself. And so I'm constantly thinking about avenues of freedom for her as a person, but I don't mention like 99 out of 100 of them. 
what I'm also doing is I'm always feeling like, where's her threshold? Like if you open up a new avenue, that can be a detriment if there's too many avenues. Mm. So I'm constantly trying to sense when are things too much. And the thing is what Sylvie is attempting to do is so hardcore that you kind of are riding a line mm. all the time. And the, it's really important to keep that line at the right side of it because the other side is really bad. And so she's doing things that are just like unheard of. The training she goes through, the self-excavation she goes through, like that's something that we share a little bit of, but you guys really don't see a lot of what that is. And so we're, it's always a balancing act it seems like fighting is our lives, but it really isn't fighting. It's like, what does fighting express? Like fighting is expressing mm -hmm. something very beautiful, very poetic, very spiritual, really. And that just happens to be the pen that she's holding. But yeah, we are trying to chill down all the time, like watch movies together and uh, watching movies together is actually what kind of like bonded us originally. But still, we're both very active, fertile minds. So even in a film, we, it goes to an inspiration of some kind of thing. But I, I do not want to understate how hard, like how dangerous it really is to walk this line. This is not a, I don't know how to say it other than that. Like your concern mm -hmm. for sure is a concern. It's always a concern for us. But Sylvie's not the kind of person that she could just go to the Maldives for three weeks. <laughs> she, part of what she does in her fighting and her training is she has a fucking engine of a heart and she has to run it mm. to, to balance herself. Mm -hmm. Like otherwise that self-critical dimension that you talk about, it will latch on without there will be no nothing to exhaust her or motivate her it'll just turn on her and be incredibly harsh but we're still learning this like we're always trying to find that sweet spot mm. we're always trying to find it dude kevin this is so beautiful i actually thought um in this conversation today like i did not know what i expected but like in, in some way I expected, I think mental stimulation, but you know what it's been from the beginning till the end, it's been like heart stimulation. Just like, like I have felt your love for her so intensely in every yeah. minute of this conversation. Yeah. Like it's <laughs> such a fucking beautiful thing. So yeah. intense, like incredible. Like your love for her shines so bright. I mean, uh, big. I <laughs> I wish, see, the one thing that we can't really share because it's impossible to share other than the sum of her life and everything is the weight she carries is very heavy. Mm. Like, like, for instance, she's an incredibly shy person mm. who's become the most documented fighter in the history of the world, mm. blogging, talking, writing. This is a person that is shy. Every time she turns that camera on, on herself, it is, there's a price paid, honestly, that she has to then um, pay back in some way to herself. And she, her doing all this, I get to see, I know there's a price paid. Other people turn on the camera, uh, the, the YouTube, and they're like, oh, what an interesting, intelligent, sweet uh, girl, fighter. Like, but the price she pays is quite high. And so that's part of my passion and my love for her is I see her paying that price. I love it. You know, the, the, I think it's easy to listen to you talk about your wife, talk about Sylvie, um, watch you be a supporter in her life and get away with a feeling like here's a, a, a feeling I had, a thought that bubbled up while you were speaking in, in this mm. conversation, which was, I wish I can find somebody who will love me this much you know, in life. But then the, my next thought, I, I thought if, if fighters watch this video, they're all going to go, where can I get myself a Kevin? Like, why did, why is my partner not this 
you know, this mm. surrendered in their love for me. But then the, my next question, which is, you know, <laughs> which a more challenging question, but a more beautiful one, maybe, yeah. was the, well, wait a second, how could I love somebody this mm. way? Right? How could I like, yeah see and and i and sylvie yeah. is a unique person right he's yes. an she's an exceptional person but i think my what i suspect and so are you and i think part of why sylvie and you get to live you know or get to manifest a, a lot of the the ways that your lives can be or could be exceptional is because of the seeing in each other the potential and believing in it and helping and pushing and living it through and making it happen versus you know being with somebody that might not see it you know could have uh, uh, crafted a totally different path right mm. um and yeah i mean kevin it's so like this is uh, very inspiring in very in a very different Than way but in a very beautiful way <laughs> very inspiring <laughs> jesus um i don't know what it is about her that uh i had other relationships before in my life which always had a good component of self-interest which feels healthy and human mm -hmm. and for some reason there's something about her the quality of the person or whatever it was mm -hmm. that my self and the timing of my life the self-interest that was normally healthily there just kind of melted away in a weird way. It was just like, it's very strange because I had no, it was no choice I made. Mm. It was more of the effect she had on me. And it's just kind of like, it's honestly kind of, it reminds me a little bit of like what, people when they get older in life after fighting for so many things they are just like none of those things matter mm -hmm. the thing that matters is whatever this is it's like we're all going to be impermanent and there's just that feeling here is that somehow she and she my self-interest just kind of melted in a very weird way um in a very satisfying way though amazing yeah. amazing i'm telling you this is i don't know how it, i mean i you can tell you know that you can suspect what it means to you guys but from an external perspective this um this is not th this is something quite rare i think um mm. and so yeah, yeah, it could be yeah 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 i, I mean i all i feel is like i wish my, i wish somebody was talking maybe wait, if you podcast her because she'll flesh it out much better than me but i'm very happy for the opportunity to like give my share because then on muay thai bones i can't really <laughs> say it this way because i'm in i'm in interaction with her but you pick up pieces of it so mm -hmm. that's actually very cool i i am so happy with this conversation <laughs> so happy for like create giving oxygen to this passion that you have for and showing that i mean it always shines through this is not like a total surprise you don't come across differently okay. in, other, in other formats but um i don't know like i think i've never felt this as intense and i've never been as inspired and i'm like i'm inspired cool. about the love that's cool. there all it has oh. the fertile ground that it has enabled to gr for so many things to grow because of it yeah. like that's so fucking amazing and inspiring it's incredible that makes me very happy that, that's that's kind of what it's all about mm -hmm. so um that's what the fighting is about in a weirdest way mm -hmm. it just thank you stelly thank you kevin dude this is uh this was so good as i said not I didn't know what would come out of it. I'm my heart is so full with love now. Like I'm so beaming from this oh, conversation. It's really, really awesome. So beautiful to see that, you know, see both of you, but also, you know, I wanted to talk to you first. Mm. Um, because, you know, you are playing more in the shadows of, of Sylvie. Um, but you have, uh, you know, you have such incredible depth and we have also established a relationship more, um, uh, by emailing and brainstorming ideas and doing things. So I felt like, um, it'd be, I was just interested in talking to you more 
Um, okay. I'm interested in talking to Sylvie as well and talking to both of yeah. you. But, uh, but I did not know uh, why and what would come out of the first conversation. I'm very happy. I'm very happy what we captured. Kevin, as always, it's been an honor and a pleasure. As I said, okay. uh, much love to you and, and Sylvie. And I'll reach out and we'll have a conversation hopefully soon. Until then, hope that you guys stay safe and happy and healthy and uh, keep training and learning. Okay. We'll talk soon.